Two, three, four. Run up your engines! Today, I'm going to talk about some changes in modern cars that you may not know about. Now, the first thing I got to talk about is your car's battery and the charging system, the alternator. They've gotten very complicated lately, but if you understand their complexity, you won't fall into a trap that I've seen many other people fall into for a lack of knowledge. It used to be the charging system was simple. The battery would start the car, sending power to the starter, running the ignition and fuel system, and the alternator would charge the battery. Decades ago, companies like Honda decided to get better gas mileage. They would have the alternator charging controlled by the main computer of the vehicle. When they started out with those systems, I saw a lot of guys, mechanics included, that would replace an alternator in a car that wasn't charging only to find that it didn't charge either because it was a problem in the computer system, which is something you don't want to occur. So you want to prevent it. Now, in many modern cars, there's a sensor called the electronic battery sensor. It's on the negative terminal going to the frame engine too. It grounds the whole vehicle, the engine, transmission, and the body of the car. Well, this electronic sensor sends feedback information to the computer about the battery, voltage, temperature, sends the information so the computer can control the charging correctly. Now, the way these things are set up today in a modern computerized car, you have to jumpstart them correctly or you're going to have a problem with that system. A lot of times if you do jumpstart a car incorrectly, it won't run right after you do that. So, all you got to do is follow this. Follow the directions of jumpstarting a car this way. Get your jump starter, put the positive on the positive terminal, and then get the negative for your jump. Stick it on a good metal part. Right here there's a bracket, right on the engine block. Now originally, people said you're supposed to jump start a car that way anyway, because when you connect the last cable, the second one, sometimes there's a spark. And if the spark is right up by the battery, sometimes you can have an explosion from the hydrogen gas that comes out. Now it's a very rare thing. It generally only happens if a battery is somewhat frozen or if you're in an enclosed area. I'm outside here, so I really don't care. I never had any problems with it. But now you really need to do this because of that electronic battery sensor. Because if you jump started it and put the negative from your jumper on the battery, the car would start but the sensor on that negative terminal is further down and it messes with how it reads and once you start the car often bad things will happen it might not idle right the charging system might not charge correctly now if you did jump start it wrong it doesn't do any permanent damage but you would have to visit a mechanic like me that has a fancy scan tool then we'd go through our scan tool stuff and we'd get to the section where we'd reset the electronic battery sensor system so it would work correctly but if you jump started by putting the negative terminal on the engine somewhere, you don't have to worry about that. So jump start them that way and you don't have to worry about messing up that stupid sensor system that many of the computerized cars have these days. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about modern cars is their batteries. Used to be when you replaced the battery, you'd replace it with the same style battery, had the same cranking amps, cold cranking amps. But today, there's various types of batteries out there, and you want to make sure you're putting the right one in your car as a replacement. You got an old car like this, it's just a lead acid battery, no big deal. Let's say your car came with an absorbed glass matte battery. They're more expensive, they have more power, they tend to last longer, crank a lot better. But if your car has one of those in it, you have to replace that battery with another absorbed glass matte battery. Because on those vehicles, the whole charging system with the computer is designed for that system. The absorbed glass matte batteries, they have to be recharged differently. When I recharge them with my fancy recharger, I have to put it on the special setting for them. You can't just use the normal full blast lead acid battery charger or it won't be charged correctly. So make sure you replace your battery with the correct battery. And in the case of quite a few modern day cars, you will also have to have the car reprogrammed for the new battery. And that's because of further refinements in computer charging technology. The first company that really went mass in that was BMW. And when you change the battery in the BMW, you have to get a fancy scan tool hooked up to reset it to tell the computer that the car now has a brand new battery in it. Now that's important because of the way the software is designed. You buy a brand new BMW, got a brand new battery. Let's say it's four years old. The computer in your car knows it's four years old and it tends to charge it more because an old battery needs more charging to keep it going. But when it finally 
something goes bad, if you replace the battery and just put it in and don't reprogram the car, it'll start. But your computer still thinks that you got a four year old battery in the car. It will charge it too much, overcharge the battery and often within a year that new battery will be destroyed. Now as you can see in my fancy scan tool, it's got a section for that. BMS. You just push that. Then you pick the car that you're working on that has that system and it allows you to reset it. Look at a BMW here. So what this computer does when it's connected to a BMW, it isn't now, <laughs> but when it is, it just allows you to reset, say you change the battery, push buttons and then it resets the whole system. Now you can't do this yourself. So if you find out that your car was one of the cars on this list and it has a battery management system that has to be reset when you replace the battery, you got to pay a mechanic to do this because if you don't, you're going to have problems down the line. And you might well ask Scotty, why are they making cars this insanely crazy? Well, because of course they can and they love making stuff computer controlled. So that's just the way it is. Realize you got one of those cars when you have the battery replaced, you're going to have to pay a mechanic to reset the system. You're not going to go buy one of these $3,500 scan tools. You just pay somebody to reset it. But realize there is a tool you can use when you change your battery or if you disconnect your battery or if you're working on the car. That's one of these memory keep alive systems. This one was like, I don't know, 12, 13 bucks from Amazon. It's very simple. This connects to any 12 volt power supply and this, it just plugs into the OBD memory port you hear it beeping so you don't lose the memory of the car some of these cars minis bmws even lincoln's they got automatic windows that come up and then down a little when you close them and then up automatically and a lot of the systems they won't work the car won't idle right when you disconnect the battery and either replace it or work on a car and then connect it back on if you have one of these keep memory alive devices hooked up you don't have to deal with any of that crap so they're very handy things and they're so cheap if you're going to work on your car if you're ever going to change a battery on your car, you definitely need to get one of these. Now the next change in technology you may not know about has to do with the glass in your car. Now your windshield has always been made out of laminated glass. There's a layer of glass, then there's a vinyl layer in between, and then there's another layer of glass under it. That's so it won't break and shatter. If you get in the wreck and hit it, it'll crack, but it won't cause jagged pieces to come and cut people. But the side glass now, originally they actually came with laminated glass, but then years later they changed the laws in the United States, and instead they have what they call safety glass. And this is tempered glass. It's made so that if it hits, it shatters into a zillion different pieces. It's not like the laminated stuff, it's cheaper to make, but they're little tiny pieces that won't cut. And if you're in a wreck and you're stuck and the power windows don't work anymore, a lot of people have those little hammers, those little glass shatters that they pop on it, then it shatters and then climb out the window. Well, some of the newer cars, they don't use safety glass on the side. They've gone back to using laminated glass. And if you have a car like that and you get in a rollover, the little hammer devices and the little ones that have a pin that snaps and shatters the glass, they won't shatter the glass because it's laminated glass. It'll just stay there. So if you've got a relatively new car, it behooves you to find out does your car have side glass that's the old fashioned tempered glass that'll shatter? Or is it the more modern laminated glass on the side? Now your windshield's always going to be laminated, that's no problem. But the side ones, they could go either way now. Find out before you need to know. The last thing you want to know is if your car rolls over, you're stuck in a ditch and you can't get out. Gee, I wonder what kind of glass I have, if I can break it or not. Find out ahead of time. Give them your VIN number and they can say that has laminated glass or that has tempered glass on the side. Easy to do, but you want to know now, not if you're in a pinch. So now you know. Cars are evolving. They're becoming more complicated that you should know a little bit more about so you're not only going to stay safe, you're going to keep from having to pay for really expensive repairs that you could have avoided in the first place with a little knowledge. And here's some bonus questions and answers. Willy Wonka's a fool says 2013 Toyota Camry four-cylinder 
I lose power once it gets above 4,500 revolutions. I had a mechanic look at it. He can't figure it out. It's got three codes, P0717, P1603, and P1605 for rough idling, engine stall, and input speed sensor. There's a lot of reasons cars can't rev up too high. It's a catalytic converter's clog that'll do that. Toyotas aren't known for that. If the fuel pump's weak, well, the older Toyotas like that aren't known for fuel pump problems. That's a new thing that they made something wrong and they got to recall a bunch of them, but that was newer than yours. I fixed one a couple months ago with the same exact problem. I drove it around with my scan tool hooked up. I erased the codes. The codes started coming back. I pushed my record button and then I looked at the data and it turns out sensor one oxygen sensor, air fuel ratio sensors, but they look just like an oxygen sensor. That's the sensor that's before the catalytic converter. And when I looked at that data, it was going and it would just drop to zero. So I checked the wiring, it was all okay. So all I did was buy a new sensor from Toyota, the original equipment one. Don't get a cheap aftermarket one like a Bosch or something. They won't work. Get the original equipment oxygen sensor bolted on and it could easily fix the problem because it did on mine. Thank goodness it was in the computer because the computer circuit could go out and do that too. It was the actual sensor itself. I replaced the bank one oxygen sensor, the one before the catalytic converter, fixed the whole thing. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.